Thank you, Rory. I'd be very happy to brief you on my time in Pyongyang or offline, maybe another time. Um, I'd like to thank the Sea Power Centre for the invitation and the Royal Australian Navy, in no small part for the, uh, the great show uh, they put on. It's always a pleasure to be back in Sydney, but this was uh, something a bit special. Um, time is short, and I want to um, not to take too much time, hopefully, for you to ask the questions at the end, but there is inherently in covering Southeast Asia quite a lot of... Uh, of ground to cover, so I'll try and skip through what has to be covered and, uh, and maybe abbreviate the rest. There are three quick three questions that I like to uh, to sort of hang the uh, presentation around. I um, mean, I was asked to give to address Southeast Asian perspectives on regional engagement and power projection. I basically hived off these three elements. First of all, to ask whether there is such a thing as a Southeast Asian perspective. Secondly, what are the Southeast Asian perceptions towards regional engagement? How is it defined? Uh, and thirdly, what are Southeast Asian perceptions towards power projection? And there are a couple of sub-questions hovering around this too. Uh, one is whether Southeast Asia is moving along congruent lines uh, or divergent lines, and then maybe also uh, uh, offering a kind of distinction between force projection and power projection, which uh, uh, may be uh, useful. Firstly then, on the kind of basic question, is there such a thing as a, a Southeast Asian perspective? Well. As the plural implies, uh, I think there are multiple viewpoints in Southeast Asia rather than a collective regional voice. I mean, there are 11 states in the region, including Timor-Leste, uh, all of markedly different sizes, national capacities, strategic traditions. And I think self-evidently there's no one, one size fits all approach. Uh, how maritime and naval fr um, priorities are framed varies according to the vantage point. And if that vantage point is Banda Aceh or Changi Naval Base, uh, Kamran Bay, Dili, uh, Sitwe in, uh, in Myanmar or Zamboanga, it all looks very different. Given that diversity, it's reasonable to ask, is there any such thing as a unifying Southeast Asian perspective on the maritime domain? And I think there are some common first principles, but I think there are some caveats that need to be uh, got out of the way first. First of all, Southeast Asia is not a unitary actor. In a sense, this is a statement of the obvious. But I mention it because increasingly we lapse into talking about ASEAN as if it is a region. Uh, and I think uh, although ASEAN has been very successful at, uh, at spreading its brand, uh, its uh, notion of centrality, uh, the, uh, the often heard mantra of being in the driver's seat, um, in a way I think basically it's, a, it's in my view a sort of outward looking uh, purpose primarily. It's a sort of badge of solidarity to the outside world. And within that, uh, it masks uh, a lot of diversity amongst its membership. And I don't think that should, it shouldn't um, obscure the differences of interest and perspective that keep the common denominator depressed, if you like, uh, on uh, cooperation for maritime security. There is a kind of glass ceiling uh, above which national security and sovereignty issues can and still do trump the collective approach. And that leads to a kind of couple of problems. One is duplication of effort. Uh, and the other is to resources being actively solicited from outside the region. Maybe that's not a problem, but it's certainly a side effect. And where interests and perspectives um, diverge most on the South China Sea, uh, I think it also leads to a, a disconnect, which has been uh, more and more apparent in the last couple of years between the diplomacy at the ASEAN level of external engagement uh, and what happens bilaterally uh, and on the ground, or more to the point, on the sea. I think the China-Philippines dynamic is an obvious example of that. Uh, I also believe that uh, a porous but still real divide between continental and Southeast Asia uh, and maritime Southeast Asia has become more pronounced as the South China Sea is exposed. So those are the caveats, but I think a quick look at the map uh, will reveal that Southeast Asia is a predominantly maritime region. Uh, its security environment is, I think, also genuinely marked apart in the Indo-Pacific for the large number of transnational issues that demand cooperation and collective action across borders and boundaries, most of which have a maritime or at least a riverine uh, dimension. And despite the land borders with India and China, I think Southeast Asia's prevailing geography is archipelagic and peninsular in nature. Uh, I'm a bit more of a traditionalist when it comes to ge geography than uh, Professor Wesley. Uh, in my view, a peninsula has to still to be attached to something. Um, but there are uh, more than one in Southeast Asia, not only the Malay Peninsula, uh, but Indochina, um, we often forget, is also a peninsula too. 
And conversely, Myanmar, um, which we think of as in the, in the continental fold, uh, also has its own mini archipelago in the Andaman Sea and a very long Indian Ocean coastline, the only country in Southeast Asia that does uh, exclusively face onto the Indo half of the Indo-Pacific. At a basic level, the states that make up Southeast Asia are all middle or small powers. That's another common but important baseline which shapes perspectives and behavior. It also constrains options. Indonesia alone has the potential to, to emerge as a great power, but I think for the foreseeable, for the foreseeable future, its navy and its civilian maritime agencies will be playing catch up with a very daunting prospect of having six million square kilometers of sovereign sea space and 17,000 islands to police with not much more than 100 operational vessels. The Philippines, in some ways, has actually uh, uh, got a, a harder problem because of a, it's coming from an even lower base following decades of neglect that have seen its air force atrophy into obsolescence and its navy struggle uh, to even meet constabulary needs. Uh, capabilities aside, I think one major commonality perspective in Southeast Asia is that all um, have uh, all have a common approach to maritime engagement conditioned by the U their acceptance of the UN law of the sea. Um, that's apart from Cambodia as the one single uh, standout example. Um, but I think there's also one key uh, difference to point out that mostly this is a sort of coastal state view of the world. I think Singapore is the one that sits um, outside of that. So given the fact that Southeast Asian countries do at this basic level have shared maritime interests and concerns, uh, and limited capabilities for ensuring maritime security, I think it is possible to generalize about the fundamentals of regional approaches to power projection and engagement. And I want to draw here, since in a way I'm uh, uh, speaking for a Singaporean slot, on my colleague from uh, Rajaratnam School of International Studies, who actually spoke at a previous Sea Power Conference back in 2006, uh, Kwa Chong Guan. I just want to pick out three quotes from his uh, essay on uh, on Southeast Asia and naval strategy. Point one, naval strategy for, for Southeast Asian navies will be limited to observing and responding to the major maritime powers interpretation and practice of naval strategy. Point two, maintaining a blue water navy to project into the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean may be an option for the major powers, but it's not an option for the Southeast Asian nations, neither singly nor as ASEAN. And his third point, what are, the major, what are the Southeast Asian responses? Well, in short, the response is to regionalize maritime security. Now, I've cherry-picked three um, comments, admittedly there, but I think a, a kind of clear perspective does emerge from that. Southeast Asia lacks the national or collective capacities to secure its own region or to prevent more powerful navies from securing slots for commerce and power projection. Southeast Asia is already a provider uh, of, of global maritime goods by securing uh, freedom, nav safe navigation for the world's merchant fleet and guaranteeing uh, transit and innocent passage rights to foreign warships and aircraft. But it's not a net exporter of maritime security, apart from some niche contributions to international coalitions, such as we've seen in the Indian Ocean. And again, according to, um, uh, to Kwa Chong Guan, my colleague, Southeast Asia's strategic standpoint is basically reactive, observing and responding. But I don't think that means passivity necessarily. And to make up for the deficit in capacity and trust among close neighbors, some Southeast Asian states have actively courted a naval presence from external powers. Others prefer to limit the involvement of outsiders to an indirect capacity building role. And meanwhile, economic development has given the wealthier countries the options to go somewhat beyond the requirements of surveillance and patrol uh, within their jurisdictional waters to acquire a modest denial presence. Nothing on the same scale, but nonetheless, if you like, a kind of mini A2 AD in the making. And whether that's benchmarking against near neighbors uh, or actually against a, uh, an emerging hegemon over the horizon, I think we can see elements of all these various strategies playing out. I want to come to the second question now and maybe focus um, more on, on uh, engagement since that's our, our overall conference theme. Regional maritime engagement has emerged as a common denominator and focus for Southeast Asian countries because this is an arena uh, where small and medium-sized countries can, to an extent, uh, control the diplomatic initiative, if not always the outcomes. In Southeast Asia, it cannot compete materially in the balance vis-a-vis -vis China or the United States or even India, 
then maintaining a hand in the choreography of external power relations is the obvious fallback strategy. And I think there are basically three objectives that condition that engagement. Number one, avoiding armed conflict between the great powers. Number two, avoiding exclusive comp competitive loyalty choices. And thirdly, attracting external resources into the region to fill the capability gaps. And that's what I think basically by what Mr. Kwa meant when he said regionalizing maritime security. This approach is certainly evident in Singapore, uh, for example, through the hosting of the multinational information fusion center, which Admiral Haney mentioned earlier. Singapore is in many ways exceptional within Southeast Asia. It's a city state possessing high end capabilities with a systemic stake in securing the global maritime commons, yet lacking maritime depth itself beyond the outer port limits. And that's why I think uh, Kwa Chong Guan's judgment back in 2006 that the RSN's principal mission is not so much to protect Singapore's territorial and contiguous maritime zones, but to ensure the security of slocks on which Singapore relies applies pretty much unchanged today. It's also worth noting, I think, on this uh, question of Singapore's maritime strategy, that while sea lane defense, slock defense, has taken on an abstracted quality for many navies as a kind of shorthand, in my view, for a country's stake in the global maritime commons, for Singapore, geography still dictates that the security of the Malacca and Singapore Strait and the South China Sea is elevated to existential importance as a kind of survival issue. And that word survival does come out uh, in, uh, in key policy statements because there's only one way in and one way out for the shipping. Um, James Goldrick and Jack McCaffrey, um, i give them a, uh, a well-deserved um, plug for their excellent uh, volume on Southeast Asian navies, and I'd commend it to you. Uh, they offer a categorization of certain Southeast Asia's as being primarily concerned about um, not power projection, but shipping projection, shipping protection in adjacent waters. And I think that sheds uh, an extra useful uh, angle of light on the force development and operational behavior of the Royal Singapore Navy, and to a lesser extent also uh, the Royal Malaysian Navy and Royal Thai Navies as well. Uh, that have invested in some of the, the uh, conventional warfighting capabilities, but without the same emphasis on power projection. There are two elements to uh, regional engagement. One is within Southeast Asia and one is outward facing. So I'll just um, deal with them separately. The intra-regional uh, engagement, well, that includes arrangements like the Malacca Straits patrols, which I think we've, you've all heard about, uh, but it also extends to the annualized meeting of um, ASEAN naval chiefs. And ASEAN has served, I think, as a collective banner for regional engagement multilaterally on, on maritime security with some success. Uh, and it's also uh, spawned the various uh, plus forums through the ADMM plus. We've heard about the uh, recent successes there. Um, but arguably that success has come at the cost of decoupling the low hanging fruit of maritime security uh, as easy wins from some of the stuff that really matters, rather like the, the ink seas that uh, have also featured a lot in recent commentary, and other elements of crisis management and de-escalation tools, which are much harder, obviously, to, uh, to secure buy into. And some observers have, have uh, already concluded that ASEAN's public display of disunity uh, in 2012 was actually the final verdict on the limits for cohesion and its potential for collective action. And maybe that's true. But I think it's worth recognizing at the working level that ASEAN has now at least regularized the annual meeting of its, of its naval chiefs. Uh, a recent um, uh, meeting was held in Manila. Um, but I think the real momentum is actually at the sub-regional and bilateral level. And just one ex example of this, uh, Singapore and Vietnam recently reached agreement on extending submarine search and rescue. Singapore has a unique capability in Southeast Asia, uh, and this, I think, shows some forward movement towards a more integrated approach amongst the Southeast Asian navies, albeit from a low base. Vietnam, I think, uh, has in its own right been quite notably active in pushing forward direct, um, direct communication and joint patrol initiatives with several ASEAN partners and, interestingly, China, too, in the Gulf of Tonkin. And that kind of organic cross-bracing engagement amongst Southeast Asian nations uh, may ultimately be more sustainable than the ASEAN top-down approach. Uh, Singapore has uh, the Information Fusion Center. I think just a few words on that are worthwhile. It's a good example of maritime engagement hosted from within the region. 
It brings in naval liaison officers from around 20 states, many of whom are represented in this room, including Australia, uh, but also the ASEAN. So I think it serves both the internal and the, and the external regional engagement brief. But uh, it's deliberately um, uh, an information sharing brief uh, in order to maximize buy-in and uh, reference to intelligence sharing, for example, is deliberately avoided. Set up in 2010, it represents a significant investment in capacity. Um, and I think as 24-hour manning has been in introduced, it gives uh, some potential to the IFC uh, to serve in a crisis response mode. Uh, and we've seen actually some instances of that with piracy. But it remains a work in progress in some respects, and buy-in is not universal within the region. China, for example, has not sent a representative permanently to the IFC. The extra-regional branch of engagement. Um, at the international level, although we're talking really about naval engagement, I will mention RECAP, uh, which is the, the regional anti-piracy uh, intergovernmental agreement. Because it's based in Singapore, it has its information sharing center there. Uh, and although it's not a Singaporean government body, um, its membership has expanded considerably uh, to include several European signatories. And in fact, Australia is going to be the next um, fully fledged member. And the United States has also indicated its interest in joining, which will bring a whole new dynamic to RECAP. RECAP, by the way, in its origins, largely a Japanese uh, derived initiative. Uh, but it's constrained by the fact that its mandate is only limited to piracy and, uh, and sea robbery. In terms of external naval engagement in Southeast Asia, the, no surprise that the United States Navy has by far the highest profile through its alliances and defense partnerships. All the range of exercises which um, Admiral Haney's already covered in detail, um, but I think that uh, Singapore and uh, the Philippines are the two standouts in terms of uh, both the active relationship now and, and future um, potential in that. Um, the FPDA provides a framework for Australian naval engagement with Singapore and Malaysia, uh, and Canberra has also been expanding re its relations with Vietnam, for example, um, from a low base, but, uh, but quite a lot of forward movement on that relationship. And I think the momentum in recent years has clearly been with Australia's thickening defence and security engagement with Indonesia, uh, and that's understandable. But I mention it also perhaps as a potential contingent issue for the new government here uh, in Australia, because I think it's possible that doubts might arise in future among Australia's oldest defence partners in Southeast Asia if the perception grows that more Jakarta spells less resource for FPDA. Japan and India's naval engagement with Southeast Asia has been growing steadily. Um, Japan's regional uh, cap capacity building now includes a modest but symbolically important defence component. Uh, and India's naval links, as uh, Roger Mohan has already uh, talked about, with Singapore and Vietnam are, I think, the, the main sort of two struts uh, of, of the bilateral relationship with Southeast Asia, but growing fast. And Indonesia has also recently expressed an improving maritime security links with India. And I think, in some ways, this is, this is really where the interesting part of the action is. It's at this sort of middle power level engagement, uh, which is not driven top down um, either by ASEAN or directed, I think, by the great powers, the United States or China, but it seems to have acquired a kind of organic momentum all of its own. And there's a noticeable uptick in diplomatic, naval diplomatic activity in recent uh, months. Just a brief illustrative statistic uh, to show this in, in, a, in the microcosm of Singapore, but I um, acquired some data before coming over here of uh, foreign Navy port calls into Sumbawang. Uh, in the north of Singapore. Uh, and uh, just to give one as illustrative year, in 2012-2013, of, of the 138 foreign ships that pulled in, 110 were from the United States, 24 from the Royal Australian Navy, uh, and then usually for the last three years, New Zealand's been in, uh, in third place. And that, I think, shows you again this sort of basic ranking still intact of uh, the bilateral relationship with the United States and then FPDA. In a way, it distorts the picture because I don't have the data for Changi Naval Base, uh, but I do know that about a third of all the port visits uh, by foreign warships into Changi are also by the United States. Third question, and I'm aware that I'm probably already stretching my time, but moving towards um, power projection. Well, before addressing power projection definitionally, I just wonder how separable this really is from uh, regional naval engagement. Rory actually made me think about this in his opening comments. 
Because I think in the fuzzy world of perceptions, even a low-level exercise can be interpreted through the lens of balancing behavior, falsely or otherwise. One man's Navy port call is another analyst's pearl on a string. Now, as long as balance of power remains intuitively persuasive as a paradigm, then strategic motivations can and will be read into the naval presence, as well as the, uh, the capacity building programs undertaken in Southeast Asia by the major maritime powers. This maybe gets to a basic limitation to naval diplomacy as a tool for confidence building, because warships may be able to, work to operate as floating embassies in a way that other military assets cannot, um, and this makes them effective uh, ambassadors for cooperation and reassurance, uh, as well as delivering deterrent or coercive messages, but they're still warships at the end of the day, and I think that has to be recognized. Maybe there'll be some pushback from the room on that point. The limitation, however, is not unique to grey hulls. Um, capacity building earmarked for civilian law enforcement, for maritime domain awareness, can also be perceived as a kind of soft or proxy power projection, especially when regional recipient countries such as Vietnam and the Philippines also happen to be the two main frontline Southeast Asian claimants uh, in the Spratly Islands. And China's reported offer of maritime surveillance capacity to Indonesia last year, I think, falls into a similar category. Even if the signal is a false one, the temptation towards overinterpretation is an occupational hazard for analysts and scholars. A distinction, um, very briefly, between force projection and power projection. I think force projection, uh, to me, uh, and this is a personal um, definition, uh, might include missions where naval assets are deployed far from the limits of national jurisdiction, uh, but for other than war missions, and hence without the same requirement for force protection and re replenishment. And very few navies have that capability in any case, certainly none in Southeast Asia. And these, um, these interactions have actually increased the scope of, of out-of-area engagement and confidence building in a two-way process. Those who've contributed to coalitions such as uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Singapore have brought back that engagement and experience. But also in reverse, we have Japan, China operating and transiting through Southeast Asia in order to go to the Indian Ocean. One key caveat, however, Malaysia and, and Indonesia still have a very strong attachment to sovereignty uh, and anti-piracy patrols in the Malacca Straits, at least in the territorial water portions of the Straits, are seen as uh, exclusively for the littoral states. One other form of external power uh, force projection, mostly welcomed into Southeast Asia, is the humanitarian and disaster relief, uh, which has got so much play since the 2004 um, tsunami. Um, and I'll, um, yeah, two minutes if I may, Chair. Um, power projection, on the other hand, I think involves clearly the threat or use of force, and uh, it characteristically requires a much higher level, level of capability. Um, what about the, um, within Southeast Asia, in, it, itself. Well, Kwa Chong Guan also made a fairly sweeping assessment in 2006 that Southeast Asia uh, was not in a position to do much more than to operate uh, to effective surveillance uh, within its own area. But he did put down a marker for the ambition to acquire uh, interdiction and maybe enforcement rights over their waters in future. Um, and although we're not at that point yet, I think two cap key capabilities do uh, uh, do constitute a, a qualified form of power projection being developed within Southeast Asia. Submarines have already had um, uh, quite a lot of mention during the conference, but I think they are in a different category uh, as a sort of uh, sea denial uh, form of power projection. Um, and as James Goldrick uh, have, has described them in Indonesian context, they, they, they're different because no diversion of equivalent, equivalent resources to other naval systems can match the same deterrent effect. Uh, and the other form that maybe gets even less attention uh, is um, the development of amphibious capabilities, which, of course, is very much on Australian minds at the moment. But there's a, a smaller corollary to that going on in Southeast Asia, uh, as uh, Malaysia, um, Indonesia uh, have acquired um, increased capability uh, and more interest in, in developing amphibious arms. Uh, and Philippines, Vietnam, Singapore all have marine corps or marine-like structures. And that's actually the more likely projection of force, albeit on a smaller scale. Um, just briefly to conclude, uh, I think, yes, there are some common denominators that we can pick out in Southeast Asian uh, perceptions. Uh, these are geographical in nature, common maritime interests, um, also the overlaid with legal aspects with the law of the sea as a major driver of the agenda now. 
Uh, Singapore is picked out partly because of its uh, global maritime outlook, but also in capability terms. I think it has to be recognized still as the only real Southeast Asian state that has a fully fledged um, uh, defense force and ability to uh, undertake missions that others can't. Uh, engagement is the fallback strategy for medium powers and small powers in the region to keep that external, uh, external maritime powers in a, to use the Indonesian phrase, a dynamic e equilibrium, uh, in a hopeful um, strategy that there will be a benign competition uh, that channels resources to the region. I think we've seen the limitations of that uh, beyond the low-level uh, capacity building uh, and uh, non-state agenda of maritime security, the South China Sea is the obvious case that uh, shows the limits of it. My final thought, just to re-emphasize that last point, that external engagement is not only a binary US-China uh, dynamic, but I think the real and interesting side of the, uh, the activity is the middle power in which I bracket uh, Australia, India, perhaps as an upper middle um, power, uh, and Japan as well, all becoming more active. So on that note, I'll conclude, Chair. Apologies for overrunning.